Hey, yo, what's up, Power Nation? Welcome to another daily episode of PowerCast. I am your host, the Golden Mike from the North, Bala Mao Power, here with another episode, bringing you exciting, exciting conversations. Now, before I start, I'd like to show respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians from the land of which I am streaming from, and also extend that acknowledgement to uh, the traditional custodians of where you are viewing this um, this episode from. Well, if you don't know what it is, this is PowerCast. PowerCast is the platform where we have yarn to deadly inspirational people uh, and have a talk about uh, their life and journeys, um, shared experiences, and just have a good time here on the program. I guess you've been seeing the feed. I think I got this intro down pat now. So uh, thank you for everybody who's been tuning in for all the episodes. I really appreciate it. As usual, the comments bars are open. So please drop comments, ask questions, uh, because this this is the girl which I will um, in, uh, which I invited on the program and has been very generous in taking this Friday evening off from a, a night out doing anything but this with Netflix and, you know, probably going out, you know, chilling with, with her peeps. She'd taken the time out to come here and have a yarn about a very, um, very, very inspirational journey. I've known her for, for a long time and you you probably would have seen her in um, media uh, around town uh, with the Black Star crew. You probably would have seen her or know her as the Bush Tucker woman. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce this is the girl to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Miss Samantha Martin. Thank you for being <laughs> on the program with me. <laughs> Yay, that was a deadly intro, Bella. Thank you. you like it? Okay. I, I was like, that I this lady. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, here she is. Thank you for coming on and taking out the time hey, to um, you know, come have this yard. You and I, we always have some um, really, really great conversations. And I always tell you when I let people, like, you know, people I come in contact with say that I, I tell them that I feel always feel enriched from our conversations because, you know, it's just, it's always great to share things that we're passionate about, you know, especially if we share values and, you know, things like that uh, throughout our journey. And we've, we've um, had a very, a few, few very insightful conversations. Yes, we certainly have, so, haven't we? We have, we have. Uh, before I, I, I get into it with, with everybody else there, but we were talking about what you're having for dinner. Uh, and we'll get into those descriptions <laughs> because it was quite tantalizing. I'm like, ah, oh, should we do this or should I just, you know, go, go dinner? <laughs> but um, I think you just want me to do that whole action again. <laughs> guess, yeah, we'll get to that. All right, for our viewers out there, sis. Please introduce yourself. Who is Samantha Martin? Yeah. Tell me about you, your mom, you know, um, where, where, you, where you grew up. You, give us give us the run of my sis. Whew. Okay, well, um, how much time do you have? <laughs> um, we so, got, yeah. usually schedule an hour, but, but we can go longer. It's fine. <laughs> oh, all good. Okay. So, yeah, Samantha Martin. Um, my Aboriginal name is Nyauru Nyadvi. Um, I'm a Jaru woman from the East Kimberley, Jaru Wollinger and Gitcha woman from the East Kimberley of Western Australia. So, um, yeah, look, I grew up in the heart of the Kimberley Ranges and um, I grew up actually quite enriched with culture and um, quite poor as well. And I guess my whole upbringing allowed me to be become the grounded woman I am today. Um, and because of the gratitude that I have because of my, my early years of upbringing, you know, and the hardship that I faced as um, a kid as well. Uh, and we all, we all can relate to this story, you know, of growing up in communities or in a reserve. Um, so I think learning from my elders was one of my um, greatest um, qualities, I, I guess, with my teachings. I learned more out in the bush learning from elders than I actually did in, in a classroom, I reckon. So I've applied more from into my life now from what I've learned from my elders, my mother, my sisters, my brothers, um, aunties who taught me so much about culture and so much about mm -hmm. living off the land, the seasonal changes, all of that. Um, then, you know, learning algebra or um, mathematics that we've learned from school and things like that. So it's allowed me to just be that person of of respecting culture and, and my roots. So in a nutshell, that's kind of who I am. And um, 
yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm a beautiful, humble, passionate person about um, learning about other people's cultures. So, again, I'd also mm -hmm. like to acknowledge the traditional people of um, the lands that we are here talking and yarning in this little gorgeous little circle we've created. <laughs> um, <laughs> the yarning circle. The yarning circle. So, yeah, it's it's about being um, and acknowledging, you know, our footsteps of where we want to be, where we want to go as well, and also acknowledging our ancestors' footsteps of how far they've come. So that's kind of me in a, in a bit of a nutshell. That is beautiful. So it's like you really did um, uh, um, uh, present that very well. And that is true, the essence of um, our connection to culture, to land, and um, you sharing the upbringing about uh, your classroom being the environment. Uh, so much, so very important today, as we see, you know, um, this time during COVID, it showed that the connection that we have to country, to our uh, to nature is very important. Uh, and um, it reminds me of an uh, experience that I had when um, I was doing some um, uh, projects with uh, Children's Ground in Alice Springs. And um, mm. the elders there told us that, you know, the best classroom is always out in nature. And you really, I, from our conversations, you've always um, carried that proudly and represented that. And that has been, um, uh, you know, showcased through all the work and everything that you, you've done. So thank you for sharing that. So uh, mm. I want to say a shout out to Dave. Dane, um, uh, who's hey, joining hey, us hey. from, <laughs> uh, good night, brother. Hope you're having a good night. And all the way from Melbourne, uh, Subban. Um, hey. uh, Subban, I hope, hopefully um, you guys are okay down there. And um, yeah, uh, it will enjoy hey. this episode. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, so tell us, what sort of mischiefs did you get up to when you were uh, growing up? Yeah. There's a little rock -rack running around. <laughs> Ooh, you had to go straight deep, eh? <laughs> <laughs> wow. No let's, start, let's, start with, let's start with, with bush games, okay? Like, you know, we <laughs> out there in nature, the things that we do, um, yeah, yeah, give us a rundown. What, what's a typical, oh. you know, um, childhood upbringing? Yeah. Well, look, um, <laughs> there's, there's different aspects of my upbringing, you know? There's like that growing up in the bush, so, you know, we were out in country, we knew all our water holes, we knew the seasons, we knew what was in season, when to go out and hunt, where to go out and hunt. So it's like, almost like us kids kind of ran the show. We knew that the glaciers are on, which are the, the green plums or the kongaberries. And it's like, let's go swimming, let's go collect some berries, you know. So we were always trying to get the elders or the old people to go and take us out, you know. So... It was allowing us to um, take control and just be present in country when we're on country. So that that's one aspect. And then from that, I moved into town because we had to go, they had to put me through schooling and I had to go through um, mm -hmm. into, um, you know, early childhood education. So um, growing up, learning about um, Catholicism or, um, you know, then learning about classroom settings and how to interact with other kids and just learning about um, schooling was the other aspect of it. Um, so I guess there was that what we all call like, you know, life. And that really, um, I think what I really loved about my life was I could always be part of the bush life. So we always got yes. elders to come and teach us about language, teach us dance, make, um, you know, columns and clapsticks and always being present. And that was something the, the nuns really preserved with our, with our education. They, wow. they saw that as a really big part of that, really wow. like early back in the early 70s and 80s even, you know, and, and almost now it's coming back, I guess. So I was very mm -hmm. fortunate to have that um, grounding from... Um, the early ch childhoods of what my elders brought into our, our schools. But, um, you know, one of the games we used to play was we used to have this big rain tree in the back of our school and um, no kissing done under the rain tree. But, but you know when they drop their Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, you hear them stories. I remember things yeah, differently. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, my stories were different from that. Okay. So that's okay. I, I won't tell but, why what happened under those trees. 
<laughs> oh no, don't even go there. <laughs> no, no, good way, good way, good way, good way. <laughs> but they drop the leads, you know, That's and then the leads would sort of like, you know, fly in the air. So one of our game was like, who could catch the leads? You know, it's a simple game, but I tell you what, it was it kept us on our feet and you're running over this way, you're running over that way, you're trying to catch these leads in the air and you're jumping and you're trying to, you know, do speckies on the other kids. And that really was just a basic bush game that we would play and it would keep us entertained all the time. Um, so that's kind of one of the, the, you know, memories, early memories I have as growing up in the bush in my early days. But then you turn into a teenager and then you kind of, oh, look, I'm sort of jumping around like all over the place with my that's, yarn that's here. Um, but, you know, yeah. one of the things I learned well, Pat was education was really important, you know. And one of the one of the things that I remember a nun saying to me, Sister Marie, she's she was my year two um, teacher, and then she left and then came back when I became a teacher's aide. And she said to me, you know, Sammy, one of the things that um, is so important is education because. Ed education will open the door to everything in life and when you're a kid you know education is very boring to us and we kind of don't see the value of it until we get a little bit older and then we have to present it on resume um so i kind of took it as a as a bit of a you know you take these little messages and you pop it in your little tool belt and you go okay i'll, I'll use that later and i'll see what that means later on in life but when I was um, when I went from primary school into high school, I understood the difference between education. And I think I told you I didn't know how to read up until I was in year twelve. So I kind of it was like that. I just kept striving to do better and to do well. So every time I would um, put in an assignment, I would I would do my best, and I would be an average of like a C, wow. you know, a C grade. Um, or a minus C grade. And then um, it wasn't until I was in year 12, I was praying to find out how to read. Like I was just saying, like, I need to, I need to do better. I, I want to be better than a C in year 12. And it was almost yeah. like a light bulb moment happened. And I swear, like, I, I feel like something just gave me the answer. Like, I don't know whether it was an angel, but it felt like something came through me and it said to me, get up wake up, I'm going to teach you how to read. So in the middle of winter in Perth, I'm getting up in my little little dormitory and I'm turning on my light and trying to read a sentence. And as I'm reading, I'm not reading like a year two or year three person anymore. I'm actually reading a whole sentence. And I'm in year 12, wow. you know, and that's a big deal because how do you get through education without learning or knowing how to read? I could write well but I couldn't yeah. quite put my sentences together. Um, so in that moment, I worked it out and something helped me to work it out. So I was just like, okay, yeah. I've got this. This is easy. Like, why didn't anyone <laughs> tell me this sooner? <laughs> I would have been okay. But, yeah, it was really, uh, um, yeah, it was that light bulb moment. Wow, well, that, that's a powerful story. I mean, Knowing um, when I was growing up as well, you know, there were certain things that when we didn't, when I didn't know um, as a, a young, you know, um, black male up in the islands, uh, I would never ask questions. There was always the stigma of shame behind that yeah. you're supposed to know that there was some some unwritten rule that if you don't know these things, you can't pick it up at the pace of that education learning. That some somehow um, you're uh, you're not. Um, equipped with the mental faculties and that's yeah. that was um I, I still believe that's a big barrier today uh oh, and yeah. you know going through that journey because it was a, a self um transition for you uh that trans that 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 moment when you had that light bulb moment but how do you see that um with have you have experience with um, your younger younger uh, people you know um, coming up with that and how do you um encourage them to overcome that that barrier of shame because it's, it's a big stigma that we carry uh and before you yes, answer, i want to say um thank you Bolly ian ian there for joining in um hope you're enjoying the program thank, and Siobhan, you. thank you for your comments yeah thanks Siobhan. you're beautiful too <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sorry, and yes, so that, that question there, yeah, um, your experiences, 
uh, with uh, you know trying to encourage um, people who have that 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 challenge with shame. Yeah, look, one of the things I, I find is, um, you know, shame wasn't part of our culture. It wasn't, um, it wasn't part of our upbringing. You know, we used to run around half naked in our community and it was okay to do that, you know, show your body off, you know, and it wasn't judged upon. It wasn't looked as something bad or anything like that. And when you fall over, it's no shame. Pick yourself up and slush yourself up and keep running, you know. Um, if you make a mistake, you know, we were encouraged as kids. And then all of a sudden the shame factor sort of came in, like, oh, my God, like when you go from, you know, a, a little community to a um, all-girls private school in Perth where you're the minority and, you know, you're like nine Indigenous girls out of 2,000 in white girls, you just sort of, or non-Indigenous <laughs> girls, you sort of, you got to know your place, you know. You, you got to understand, like, um, you either fit in or you don't. And a lot of us, we always got homesick, and and we never lasted. And I think this is a big problem as well, is because a lot of the students or people um, that struggle with education, if they were to go from their communities into um, a school or get sent away, they struggle with that homesickness. And it's that whole factor of, I don't know how I fit into this world. I don't know how um, to be that. No one's shown us how to do that. And I guess for me, it was about just observing, just looking around, asking those questions, like knowing. And when someone told me that it's okay to ask questions and not be ashamed of any mm. question, someone said, no question is a dumb question. When that that sort of rung in my head, I realized that, there's power behind that that sentence in itself. So even though I feel dumb or feel stupid for asking this question, I'm just going to ask it anyway, you know. So I got yes. to that point where just pushing through the barriers and and having not taking yourself serious. And I think that's what we do too much of is we don't know who we are, which then puts us in, in our own little cage or our own little box and then we yes. become caged in there. It's not everybody else judging us, and it's not the shame factor of what people are trying to or think of us. It's the shame factor that we have of ourselves. So it's overcoming mm. our own barriers and um, just believing in yourself, you know. So if you have and, – and I have gone to schools and we've taught literacy and numeracy through television and, um, you know, documentaries with our um, – our, our production company um and these kids i i see them come in and you know the the headmasters would say oh sam you'd be lucky to get a couple of kids in and obviously you know like it doesn't matter two's better than none and then before you know it by second day more kids are coming in they hear that i'm in town the bush tucker woman's there and then they all start coming in and then we yes. have a full class and I have principals and teachers going, we haven't had this kid come in, you know, since February and it's now July and they're all, they're here every day. And it's like, well, it's because yes. they have someone that they can relate to. They have someone who's saying like, no shame here, you know, like let's, mm. let, I know what you're going through and I know what it feels like not to be able to read, but let's do it in a fun way. So let's create storyboards. Let's create things of, mm. you know, going out on hunting on your country and learning about um, film at the same time and then capturing those moments and talking to elders and capturing those moments and then creating a documentary that they can show on NITV at the end of the day, you know, and it's like Amazing. that proud moment. Yeah. So it is breaking that barrier down, but it's just saying like, don't, don't let yourself be shame of yourself. That's the thing. Mm. Like I never walk into a room and think to myself, I'm the only black person in this room or shame job. I go, I'm the only black person in this room. Hey, they, everyone should be very lucky to have me in this space, you know. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> no, that's true. I, I do the same thing. I walk in and say, I'm the only own black it. person in this room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, and yes, um, Siobhan, yes, um, the, the topic of homesickness is, is a very – um, mm. it is one that's discussed quite a bit. It's been around for a long time. I, I remember growing up and seeing that um, very, very strong in the community. Uh, people go away with great opportunities. 
or what's perceived as great opportunities, but it's that that um, homesickness that bring, seek, that bring him back home. And I know mm-hmm. uh, 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 one of my bros uh, who always joins on here, Marty, uh, he, he, we always talk about the support mechanism that's needed. Uh, and that was one of um, the biggest thing I found out when I left the islands and I went to places like Toowoomba to study and then to Adelaide, it was uh, the, the absence of a support mechanism. Uh, yeah. that was around there to keep someone in place where you can still be attached and experience culture. I mean, later on, I think the communities uh, came together uh, and then started to get their own little communities happening and we do the, the celebrations and then we go do practice the, the culture still, uh, cooking together. And that, that's yeah. very important. Those simple things are the cornerstone of what binds the community together and family kinship. Uh, mm-hmm. And this time, um, I, I had oh, here's actually Diane Kerr as well, all the way from Melbourne. Thank you very much yeah, um, yeah. for joining, Hi, and um, and thank you very much for um, inviting uh, me to go on to your your page. We can do this for the families down in Melbourne right now. I know that they're going through a very difficult time in isolation, uh, so mm-hmm. we're sending our thoughts and love out to everyone um, from down there that's tuning in. Uh, and yes, um, if, if uh, those um, who are joining in, just reach out and say hi. You know, I, I think uh, everyone would pr- appreciate that right now at this time. Yes. Um, I wanted to go into the Bush Tucker uh, woman side, that journey. I find that very fascinating. Uh, but one one area that I wanted to talk about, because you mentioned um, as you were growing up, life happens. Uh, and yeah. life does take you down in tracks and there's a lot of experiences some are a a great experiences some are uh, tough learning lessons Uh, i have experienced um, a lot of those that we've shared uh is there um can we go into that space with you and talk about some of those those uh, difficult times the challenges uh and you know i just because i I, i'm really passionate about that i see that happen with young people like still still Mm -hmm. today it becomes like it's almost um, it almost becomes the norm that these mm. these experiences, like uh, for myself, you know, with different things like substances and different things like ro- walking down the wrong path, um, just by choices, um, uh, ill-informed choices, and not being educated, and it led me down very, very, um, you know, difficult places. Coming back out of that sometimes is a very hard thing. But I, I know we've talked about this a while. I would love to hear if you had any experiences out there uh, in mean, this, this part of life. A hundred percent. You know, I had, um, I was going through a big um, transformation after I left high school. Um, I spent four years in boarding school in an all white girls school and I was picked on all the time or it makes me emotional, <laughs> um, discriminated all the time. And I was always fighting for a, a place of existence. Even in high school, I was challenging my social studies teacher about you know, Captain Cook wasn't the first, um, you know, p- person here in this country. Um, and where do I belong if he was? Like, you need to tell me this now so I can tell my family that we don't belong here because you're telling me this and you're teaching all this. And, you know, so it was like mm-hmm. I lear- I, I'm learning a different culture. And then I take that home and I was sort of torn between the black culture and the white culture and where do I fit in? So mm-hmm. it kind of, although education was fantastic, it left me in a, in a land of limbo basically, because mm-hmm. then I came back and I spoke well and I came back and I presented well and I was good at sports and I was, you know, winning trophies and I was I was excelling, which is what you expect to do when you go away for four years of being in a boarding school. But then when you get back to your community, they look, look you down, you know. They're like, oh, she's too, she thinks she's too good for us or she thinks she's too smart for us or she's too white for us, you know. So you kind of get trapped in, well, I'm not. I was the, I'm the, still the same person that when I left, I'm just, I just got a few more tools now, you know, and, I, and I've been vested in a few more knowledge and stuff. So it really took me down a place where I, the only thing that I could find a bit of comfort in was to, to drink and to do drugs. So I started um, hanging out with some, you know, some interesting people in my community and, and they dabbled in drugs and they were party people. So you know, this little good girl, little Catholic girl that um, mm. grew up, in, has grown up in a good family with all this, you know, grounding and very respectful family is now going down this really dark tunnel. And mm. it, it, was, it was a bit too late before I could sort of 
turn around and say, oh, I don't want to do this anymore because I was already invested. I was already gone. And um, I just, I didn't know how to sort of get asked for help in that retrospect because then my family started to push me away and they gave me an ultimatum. And when you give a teenager an ultimatum, of course they're going to rebel and they're going to say, oh, well, you know, up yours. Like, I'll just keep going down there if you don't love me enough to accept me for who I am or help me. Um, you know, I'm just going to turn to the bottle. So I became a full-blown alcoholic by the age of 17 and I was drinking mm. bourbons and, you know, and I was, but I was one of those people that knew how to hide it well. So I held, a, for a 17-year-old girl, I held a really high profile job um, on a mine. I was very lucky to get a traineeship and then worked my way up the ladder very fast. And I used the education and, you know, my presentation that I was taught of how to present myself to get these these roles. And um, I was abusing it, you know. I was really abusing my um, these opportunities and these people and I just got caught up in the wrong crowd and, you know, caught up with the bikers and um, I just found myself becoming a person that I, I couldn't recognise anymore. Um, you know, when I wake up and I vomit or I go to sleep with, you know, I've just built a whole bottle of bourbon all over me or, you know, just really horrible things. And it wasn't a weekend that I wasn't drunk and partying and drunk driving and speeding and doing all these burnouts with all the boys and just doing really horrible things. And, and I know my family were really, it was hurting my family to see me do this, but I had no way out. I thought I had no way out. But after a while, my whole body started to struggle. So by the age of 19, so in within two years, my body was changing and I couldn't, I, I was vomiting blood and then I woke up one morning and I looked at myself in the mirror and I had lines in places where I shouldn't have lines and my teeth was grey and my lips were, you know, like blue and my eyes were constantly yellow. So I knew my organs were struggling and that something was not right here. So in that moment... I was actually scrubbing my face to try and make myself have colour. And I thought, this is not cool. So I went out to the table where we would sit and, and do bongs and cones and whatever and drink, you know, until the sun comes up. And I grabbed every bottle on that table and all our drugs and I threw it down the toilet. And then my partner at the time woke up and was looking for his fix first thing in the morning and it wasn't there. And I said, I, I threw it all away. And I knew the only way I was going to survive this, um, this thing, this disease or this addiction was to get rid of everything around me immediately. Um, so he woke up and he was in a rage and he beat the living daylights out of me. And he was smashing my head into the concrete. And I had friends around me who were too scared to help me, except a little little boy that was I could hear in the background going, um, you know, leave Bunny Ham alone, leave Bunny Ham alone, and trying to push this guy off me. And he, um, I just somehow escaped, locked myself in a room, and I was praying for someone to come and rescue me. A friend felt like she wanted to hang out with me, came down, I was in the room locked in and, and then as soon as I could escape, I was gone with her and I said, take me out bush. And she goes, what's wrong with you? And I've got blood pouring down my face, my head split open, um, you know, my lips busted and I just said, take me bush, take me bush. And she's like, I'm taking you to the hospital. And I'm like, no, you take me bush. And so we just went out bush and she just cried all the way out. Mm. and um yeah. my family don't even know the story so yeah. yeah and that was my turning point that was my part of my decision of saying no more i can't do this anymore i have to change i'm 19 and i'm not going to die by overdose i'm not going to die of drug abuse or alcoholism i'm better than this i'm educated i'm 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 someone who is meant to be on this earth and if i'm struggling now imagine what i'm going to 
happen later on in life, you know, and life had to change and I made that decision right there and then. And when we sat in the water holes on country and I just let that water wash all the blood away and I came to and I said to myself, okay, I'm going to make this choice today. I'm going to ask my ancestors to walk with me. And if you hear me, you need to show me. And in that moment, this big eagle came flying down in front of my friend and I, dove into the water and picked this brim up out of the water and just flew away with it. And I said, what more can I ask for? Right there was wow. my children's voice. And I wow. never looked back. I left this person. I got my own place. I got a new job. And, you know, I had to fight for my life. I was being stalked. I was being, you know, harassed and bashed. And my life changed so much. But I knew that I either had to stand up for myself or I had to be or be victim in, in the, that way of life. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's. It's a common story. It is. And and yes. a lot of people can relate to my story. Like if I tell this story to a group of people I've never known, I'm surprised of how many people say, oh, my God, Sammy, like this is something that's happened to me. Or, yeah, that, that happened to me too. And Or I know a friend who has had the same problem, you know, and it's, it is that common story. The more you talk about and not afraid to talk about it, you know, the yes. darkness of life. I think that's where the yes. healing begins. And I yes. never looked back. I went cold turkey and I never went back to alcohol or drugs um, until three years ago and my partner left me and, you know, it's like I made up for the, the you know, 20 years of not drinking <laughs> in a year. Yeah. But it was yeah. all part again about healing and, you know, going through that transition of life, I guess. Absolutely. Such a powerful story. And you got some comments coming in. Sabron uh, says, you know, um, thank you for discussing this, Samantha. And Martin, mm -hmm. Martin just put a couple of powerful stuff. Thank you for sharing. Dane, uh, Dane, you say, I'm a powerful and strong woman. Uh, thank you for sharing um, your heart. And it is. And this is the reason why we wanted to have these conversations and have courageous, powerful voices such as yourself who come in mm -hmm. and share these experiences. Uh, because... It, it is a, it is common, but it's uncommonly discussed. Uh, and to be able yeah. to, and really from 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 my heart, thank you very much for being so open and being able uh, to be this free and opening out this. And I, yeah. um, I'm getting my my ears are standing up, uh, goosebumps. Um, and you know, I know of these these stories as well, and seeing these stories as well. Uh, and you know, growing up in that that type of environment, um, allowing the conversation first, hiding away. And like you said, when it's hidden in the dark, there is no healing. Normalizing mm. the conversation to be allowed to speak uh, in that process of healing, but speaking with knowing that it's a safe, supportive place, um, mm. that's that's the, the beginning of that transformation and the beginning of that healing. And you do it so well. That's why I love our conversations when we get up. We were always honest. Uh, and now people are able to tune in and you know join us uh, in this, this conversation. And uh, I'm glad you do make the decision because you're here sharing this beautiful story with us. Can I just say something? <laughs> so a lady yes, just came in as well, Sister Mora. Yep. Um, so yes. she, one of the, the nuns that, that um, uh, I work with. So thank wow. you. And she, she's also well, part of my blessings of, you know, giving me a, a chance as a young girl um, to work in the school I grew up in. So thanks for joining us, Sister Moira. Yes, thank you for joining us and thank you for dropping your line. Uh, and um, yes, so we're sending like, great vibes to everybody right now who's feeling emotional when hearing these stories. Uh, yes, we, we are thanking you for um, your, uh, joining us and allow us to share this conversation together. Please do drop our, our questions and, and please more comments. This is great. Uh, that way we can keep the discussion going. Um, now you, you've gone through this journey and you made an amazing transformation. And when you said that that sign where the eagle came down and picked up that brim, my mm. hair stood up on the back of my head. Like, <laughs> and you know, I, I, I've known from the longest I've known you, you've been very, very connected to culture. You've always been that person that I've seen. Uh, and 
you know, during this this journey, the next part of the journey now um, that you you um, went on, how important was it to have that be with you, the whole, like carry that with you and understand that, but not only carry it, but live it. Oh. If you can share your experience. Yeah, look, oh, I don't even know where to start with that, Bala, because at the end of the day, I think a lot of people are saying, you know, our, our, we grow from our adversities and we yes. learn how to apply our pain and our happiness into any situations. You know, we, we go through, we must go through all of this to make us a better person. And I don't, I don't look at my adversities or uh, my challenges as something that is a, a weakness. I, I see that as something that has given me the strength to really be the person I am today. You know, I've, mm -hmm. I've, I grew up very poor. I grew up with an alcoholic mother. I grew up without a father. I had, um, you know, abuse in my family. I was abused. I was um, physically abused. So my people look at me and they go, yeah, but, you, you know, you look so beautiful. You present yourself so well. You got, you're educated. You speak so well. And, you know, like when I start to talk about my story, they go, oh, I didn't realize, you know, you were a victim mm. to that. And I go, no, but I wasn't a victim to any of that. I don't, I'm not a victim to that now. I may, may have been, mm. but I don't choose to be a victim to that. I've gone through life mm. blessing those experiences. It's the only way I could heal from it and forgive it and forgive those people who've hurt me, you know, and the healing mm. started, you know, it had to start with myself and my mother. And, you know, my mother is such a beautiful, strong woman and she's so cultured, but she's had a lot of trauma happen to her as well. And at the age of 13, I watched her always getting, you know, or as long as I can remember as a kid, getting bashed up by her partner and then trying to, you know, help her and, and fix her up. And, you know, got to the point where I'm, I'm 13 telling my mother to fight back and say to her, if you don't fight back, you're just showing me that I'm going to be weak, that I'm going to have this happen to me. You need to set, set an example and show me that I need to be a strong woman, but I don't know how to be that if you're not that. So in that moment, things change, you know, and um, Sister Maury, if you're listening to this, you know, you, you probably, um, yeah, like this is an, a, um, it's a private affair that happens in, in homes that we don't, we don't expose, you know, like domestic violence is something that is um, not talked about and not discussed. It's that, it is that shame factor, you know, that um, in the daylight we're this as a family, but at nighttime we're, we're something different, you know. We're dealing with a lot of things behind closed doors and in our houses. So um, I had to understand that I didn't want to be like my mother. I didn't want to be like what my culture was starting to to look like which was you know alcohol and um and drugs and all of that um but although i did that i didn't realize i was doing it i wasn't i didn't realize i was actually part of it until it was too late and it was like okay i've got to check out now and time it, yeah. you know it, it almost forced me to have a good look at myself and go do you really want this didn't you say when you were 13 you didn't want that why are you here at 19 and you're doing it, you know? Like, come on, make better choices. Mm. What, do you, what is it that you want to do? So, yeah, like my life has changed. I've experienced so much. I've traveled the world. When I was young, I always thought, and we had black and white TVs, and that's showing my age. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> I remember watching the Bush Tucker man going, oh, my God, look at his job. He get paid to do that? Going on country? That's what we do anyway. I want to be like him, you know? And then, you know, I'm like, I know that, yeah, Barry, too. I know that, you know. And so that's kind of where that that seed planted was about the bush yes, woman yes. being on TV. And when I'd say to to my friends and family, I want to be on TV, they're like, ha, ha, you know, you get me, you're not going to be on TV, you know, or I want to write a book. <laughs> and they're like, eh, big way. How are you going to write a book? You don't even know how to read, you know. <laughs> like, oh, well, we you know, hear them all the time. <laughs> right? So, yes, like, yes, yes, yeah. They want to bring you down too, you know? So, yeah, I, I, mean, with that, I mean, with yeah. that conversation, like, you know, that's how I used to perceive it as well. Like, even starting your music, I used to tell people before I started rapping, 
I used to get into fist fights because I was a person in a rap, rapping. Like I had to defend this, and I I would say I got scars to prove I fought to actually be a be a singer. But when I look look back on it now, that same mindset where I said you know they were trying to pull me down, it's just that we we didn't see anything better. Once I left my community and started seeing the world, I'm like wow this. This can actually there's more out here to be able to grow from, um, and that's that's you know I think that was the the um, experience I got from those 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 moments. And so mm-hmm. you, you was you would say you 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 you're inspired by the Bush Tucker man. You say you're gonna write a book. You have people say this can I, you don't even know how to read. Are you gonna write a book? But then fast forward, you do all of that. How did I know the scene was planted, but what, what, like, I, I'm, I'm inspired and curious by the point when you knew you could do it, and then that point where you said, not, not only I'm going to do this, but this is happening now, like I'm doing it. When yeah, was that for you? It was, I guess, a turning point when I had already left. So I had my 21st birthday at home, and I um, had. I had my speech, and in my speech it was, um, you know, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm just letting you all know there's, you know, drinks over there, food over there, dance floor over there, um, and tomorrow I'm on a bus out of here. I've just booked a one-way ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be coming to Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. like, you know, my mum get up and walk away um, mm. in absolute, like, shock. And then, you know, having to track her down later on and go, you know, mum, I have to do this and I can't, I can't do this if I don't have your blessing. So, pardon me, four o'clock in the morning, you know, I go over and she's up on the veranda. That's where she used to sleep in my sister's yeah. place. And I'm packing my bags and I look over and there's a cigarette and I'm like, mum's up. So I should go over and say good day and watch the sunset with her, uh, sunrise with her. So I'm sitting there, we're in quietness and I, in the darkness. And I said, you know, I know you, you can't talk because your heart is probably in your throat right now because I can feel mine is. I said, but I will start by saying I can't be a better person if I stay in this town. I can't achieve my goals if I, if I stay in this town. Um, I love this town and I love everybody in it, but if I stay, I will be what everyone is painting my future to be. I will end up being barefoot and pregnant and will have a tribe of kids that I probably don't know the daddies are. And, yeah, I'd be that person. And I don't want to be that mum. I said, I want to be something different. I want to be more, you know. You guys invested money into giving me an education and and we it didn't come out of the government's pocket. It came out of their hard earnings and fundraising for me to be educated. So I don't want that to go to waste. And if I go away, I will learn tools and I'll come back and apply it into the community one day. And it's been 22 years later and, you know, I knew that the moment I jumped on that bus and booked that one-way ticket and I, I could finally breathe like something was lifted off my chest and my shoulders going, okay, my life, new chapter, new canvas. I've got to start writing. Like what is it that I want to create? What do I want to do? And I was this beautiful little size 10 little Indigenous girl, still didn't know who herself was, but still was like I want to try and fit into the world. And after all the travels around Australia, I ended up in the Whitsundays where I was, again, the only Indigenous person there. And, you know, below there was one part where I actually pretended I wasn't Aboriginal because I would go to parties and everyone was doing that whole thing of um, bag doing those um, Aboriginal jokes, you know, and, the, you know, the, like, the shamefulness that came from, from me. And, and I thought to myself, pick your battle, Sam. You can't go to every party and fight every person that's doing a a typical Aboriginal joke and being derogatory to your culture. You have to you have to pick your battles, you know, and if you want to fit into this white community, you have to figure out a way to. So I just pretended I was Polynesian or Balinese or I was um, I was something that I wasn't. And then Mm. it, 
it lasted for about a year. Really, I, I could get away with it. I was faking it to make it, basically. And then one day, I got these dreams, and they were really heavy dreams of country and heavy dreams of elders and ancestors. And they were waking me up and, like, dragging me literally out of bed going, and talking to me in language and I'm like I don't know what this means like what you love doing here stop humbugging me you know let me go back to sleep we get my beauty sleep we've got modeling tomorrow you know <laughs> but, but they were telling me to go home they were telling me to go home and it wasn't a sense of going home it was a sense of going or coming home in myself so in that moment I realized what they were trying to say and I understood that they were trying to make me come back to my aboriginality and figure out and own who I was so you know what I did I started my niece and I started a dance group and so every single event that was happening in the Whit Sundays I was painting myself up and I was putting myself out there dancing to Jabana and I was wearing my my costume with pride and people were like, I didn't know she was Aboriginal. Oh, my God, she's Aboriginal. Oh, no. you know, and it's like, yeah, man, I'm Aboriginal and I'm proud of it. If you don't like it, you know where the yes. door is, you know, go and yes. take a hike. So I own that moment of just understanding that. Hi, Sarah, my niece from from New York just tuned in. Um, from New York, yeah. Yes, yeah, Sarah. All the way from the Big Apple. Yes. I visited her in um, New York as well. So, Fantastic. Thank you for um, joining in all the way from New York City. I hope everything is okay over there and you guys are safe. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, look, that, that in that moment, I realized that life had to change. I had to understand that my journey um, has to start with me, me and, and, and no one else. So it was then acknowledging who I was and then learning, um, you know, how to present that into a world that was really, they, they weren't exposed to Aboriginal culture. I was the one that mm. brought Aboriginal culture into the Wit Sundays. Even though I was a Kimberley girl, I was going into Proserpine School and teaching kids how to dance, you know, and then going and doing, setting up a paddling through history and painting a canoe with Aboriginal designs. And, and then when I'm on the fashion mm catwalk I'm like with feathers and you know with my dots on my face and all the other girls are just them and I'm and I'm me and I'm like here I am guys and so that was that was the turning point for me was like okay I'm a big girl now I'm on my own yes and I have to figure this out and I have to own my shit excuse my French yes <laughs> that's okay and we've got some beautiful comments um, coming in. Um, there's a uh, Sister Marie is watching now, uh, but trying to work out how to write a comment. So thank you, Sister Marie. Oh, Sister Marie was the lady, was was the woman, um, was my teacher in year two, who I mentioned. Uh, well, who gave me that beautiful amazing. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for tuning in, Sister. To Marie and um, Paul, Paul Page, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, thank you very much for dropping a comment. Oh, <laughs> this is great. This is very inspiring. And um, sorry, I was just saying. Oh, you were talking to my yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that's amazing. I mean, um, it, it is uh, uh, a battle between the identity when you are, uh, are growing up. Uh, you made to feel a certain way by who you are. I'm glad that. You know, um, you can proudly own that. Like, you know, I see a lot of young people still grapple with that as well. So these stories that you were sharing is very inspiring and will uh, inspire some young ones now watching. Uh, will be able to watch this because this will live online for many years to come. And it's the whole purpose is to be able to um, have that shared experience, a shared story out there to make sure that we are able to show that there are. Um, we all go through uh, some form of challenges at some point. But there's a transformation that happens if you're willing to accept and allow the culture to come and walk with you. Uh, and I've seen you represent that and um, you're in everything that you've done. Uh, and I would like to direct this one to now the um, the journey of the Bush Tucker woman. Uh, mm. I've seen and if anybody's interested, like, you can watch it online on YouTube. I watched a few there, like I watched some of the episodes and oh. uh, to deadly sis. 
you walking out there, you know, <laughs> actually, you not only it's not it's not just like a, a guy, it's not a cooking show, it's not just a cooking show. Like sister goes out there and gets the food and show you how it's done. This is this is amazing. So, you know, when you were when you knew that you were able to, you know, this was gonna happen. Tell me what you were feeling and what you know how that experience, um, the journey of that experience. Yes. So it sort of started with um, a new partner that I brought into my life in Sydney when I was working for the ABC. And just, you know, I went from being this girl that was um, living in the bush in, back in the Kimberley, then I went from living in the Whit Sundays in a sarong and, and bikinis and a flower in her hair, the Polynesian girl, to, and totally tanned, to then moving to Sydney and um, losing my tan, losing my sarong <laughs> and my, <laughs> and my bikini <laughs> and that flower. You're not supposed to look colourful in Sydney. You've got to be black and grey suits. So, and then losing my personality somehow. <laughs> I don't know what happened. But I spent like six years in Sydney. But throughout that time, I would walk the streets and I'd be like running into people's yards and picking plums and berries and, you know, passion fruits and stuff. So I was always harvesting on my walks around the suburbs of Bondi and um, mm. Bellevue Hill and Watson's Bay, you know, and all these really ritzy places, by the way. <laughs> but I, I went into this, this thing of like, hey, what if the world was to end? Would people know how to survive? Or what if Great something question. happened to the world? Um, how would I survive? <laughs> Could I survive? You know, and then it was all these questions yeah. I was asking myself. And then I went to my partner at the time and I said, you know, would you know how to survive if the world end or, you know, something happened to, to you know, our shops and stuff? And he was like, nah, I don't know. Well, oh, you know, I was a army skill, but now nah, I wouldn't know what to eat or pick like you. And, he's, and I went, hey, we've got something here. Why don't we start like a survival mm. video or something, like a YouTube or something that would say, hey, you know, like I'm a, I'm a female Indigenous girl and I want to teach you guys how to live off the land and not just off the land in the bush, but in the suburbs of Sydney. So just with a little mm. phone, he was following me around and videoing me. And it became just a little hobby that became fun. But then I w after brainstorming, you know, over a couple of glasses of wine, we were like, hey, there's a big story here. Like, you know, let's give the bush tucker man a run for his money. Or let's uh. challenge you know, or let's be the, the black version of that or the female version yes. of that. So that's kind of how it, it developed. And then um, we kind of apply for grants and staff to, uh, to develop the Bush Tucker Woman or My Adventures with Samantha Martin. Um, and we kind of got a little bit of funding, but not a lot to create a, a massive, you know, um, following or um, production. So we just said, well, let's just go and get a loan and, and buy our equipment and let's let's go and, and do this. Let's start filming. So after seven years of not being home, I took my partner home and that was our first production of going back on country. And then that's how the Bush Tucker woman was born. And then he couldn't believe wow. it. He was like, I'm seeing you. I'm seeing two different people. I saw her, I saw you <laughs> in the city and how you were foraging and living, you know, off the land there. But look at you here in the bush, woman. And then you know, when you go home, you, all your English go broken. And then you start oh, yes. I was just going to say that. People know that like, when did that transition happened and you know you're comfortable home, English out the door, we start talking now proper way. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, he's going back to his roots. <laughs> Yeah, proper. And then he was like, he didn't know how to take it. And I said, well, welcome to my my world, you know. And then um, we applied for NITV and we, we, we got the first two um, episodes up. And then we wanted to produce a few more episodes, but they kind of shut the bush tucker down. So mm. my idea was to create more stories and start producing not just – not just me being on country with the traditional owners and acknowledging that, but now talk about the the well-being of bush tucker, like the survival skills, yes. but also the superfoods that bush tucker has. And then I wanted to start 
proposing that, you know, like going back to traditional way will better our health and our well-being. Um, acknowledging, you know, how the nutritional value is so powerful in our in the in our traditional bush tuckers and bush medicines. And um, yes. they didn't want a bar of it. They didn't want NITV, wow. and I'll say it straight out, they didn't want a bar of it. They gave the, they stole the concept, they gave the funding to someone else in Sydney and Bush Tucker Woman just went, <laughs> and even though Bush Tucker Woman was really highly viewed on NITV and I was getting emails from non-Indigenous people right across the country saying, oh, my God, this show is really amazing. Thank you. Like, you've taught me so much. And thank you, you know, for, you know, taking us to your country and taking us to all these people's beautiful lands. Like, it was so highly respected that who wouldn't mm. want the Bush Tucker woman to be gracing their TVs and their people's living rooms with the kind of information that I wanted to tap into, which was health and well-being. Yes. So it really yes. knocked me off the off my perch. They knocked my confidence right out of me. And they they showed me I wasn't good enough to be on TV. And that, you know, I don't know what they thought, but you know, when you get a letter rejecting your views and your application with beep, 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 big signature right across the page, like to make a point across to me, I'm just like, okay, mm. well, we'll do this. We'll do this our way and we'll invest our money, our own money, not government funding, but our own money into this Bush Tucker woman. So then we created two yes. more episodes and we knew there was an importance by doing what we were doing. So we yes. just kept doing it, you know, and and I thank I thank NITV and the people who backed me and backed um, my partner at the time and our business and our concept because Without putting it to NITV, we, we wouldn't have got the bush tucker to people's living rooms to get to know who yes. she was. But out of that, too, became, um, you know, the right person watching the show one night and said, who is this woman? We need to get hold of her and we need to produce mm. a public book with her. And that was um, Hardy Grant in the biggest publish house in, in Melbourne. And they picked up the story. Amazing. And, and and they wanted the knowledge. So, yeah, so that kind of just grew like that. And then I, I discovered that I needed to, um, I needed to honour the space of knowledge. So my journey yes. of then, you know, I became quite unwell because of um, lifestyle choices and travelling a lot. You eat junk food and I was drinking litres and litres of yes. soft drink, becoming very unhealthy. Yes. And I went from a size 12 to a size 26, literally, mm. you know, in a few years. And I didn't see myself growing this mm. way and this way and becoming quite large. I just um, felt very sluggish and very slow and very unmotivated and very unfocused. And I was like, something's not right with me. So I went to the doctors and I um, had a sore foot that wouldn't get better. And they said, well, it's infected. Um, we'll need you to go on tablets to try and bring that infection down. And if it keeps getting infected, we're going to have to cut your foot off. And they ran all these tests on me and found out I had undiagnosed diabetes, which is another thing a lot of our people don't do is get themselves checked for, sh for sugar diabetes. And yes. we live with it and then we don't know we're, we've got this issue and our insulin, um, you know, and our organs are suffering because we aren't taking care of ourselves. So when you're, for me, it was like, what, where do I start? How do I do this? Do I just take tablets and try and get myself better that way? Mm -hmm. Or do I now change my mentality and look at what's happening on a bigger scale? So it, there's another rabbit hole I went down is, you know, cleaning out my cupboard, cleaning out my fridge, pulling all the yes. processed foods out and then filling my freezer and fridge up with, with fresh fruit and vegetables and, you know, good produce and game meats instead of chickens and stuff from the shop. So I started yes. eating well. I lost 16 kilos in um, three weeks. I couldn't walk, 39 on a cane. I couldn't walk, my foot was swollen, and then all of a sudden it was like it was like I, I had a new lease of life. When that weight started to fall mm -hmm. off me, 
I realized, realized, realized I, I can't. So I went from a size 28 to then a size 14 to a size 12. And now consistently trying to just maintain that. So living healthy and, and making healthy choices with foods and, you know, and walking, moving the body was um, the first mm. step for me to do. If someone said to me, um, I don't know, five, ten years ago, you will love walking, Sam, even though I did when I was in my early 20s, I would have gone, yeah. yeah. Looking, yeah. No. <laughs> I'm right there. I'm meeting my bear. <laughs> I see you walking there, Espinosa, from time to time. Uh, and every time you walk past, I say hi, and you're just like skipping past, <laughs> like, oh, she's in a zone now. <laughs> she began to bother me. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know, um, you know Bala, in my head i'm actually talking to myself i'm doing affirmations i'm i'm getting this right mm. you know like mind yes. body and spirit all relates to our mental emotional and physical well-being and when yes. we understand that it's all connected and how we have to look after it and acknowledge it then that's when the true healing begins. It's like facing your demons from years and years ago to become mm -hmm. a clean slate to start a new journey. And how do you want that Absolutely. to look? Like how, what, what colors do you want to throw on this canvas of life we mm -hmm. call life? So, yes. yes. And that is true. That is true. And, um, you know, I always say to people when you have this discussion, you'll do it, if not for anybody else, yourself, because you deserve it. You're worth it. And that's what this journey is about. Everything else external is external, but your internal well-being, it's, it's, you have the power to be able to make that transformation. And you're a living testament of that. I mean, such a, an amazing story, an amazing journey. Uh, and I've seen all the beautiful comments of people that you know and don't know have just met you through this this um, live stream. It's, it's been a, it's an amazing conversation. Uh, you have Sister Marie that just uh, uh, sent her a message to you then. What a wonderful surprise. <laughs> wow, oh, you, you two teacher is um, dropping light. Yes. <laughs> and yes, um, uh, thank you, Savon and um, Sarah for your messages. Now, um, yeah. usually I, I see the time there and I, I know you have a roast on. You want to explain? Okay, oh, so I, 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 I said I, I was going to ask this question. Hang on. And there's two questions. I two questions. Right. One, you're with, with Bush Talk or what? what, what Bush taco or whatever it is that you you do, what's your favorite dish? Like if Take you had time, to Bella. choose and <laughs> you were to present, <laughs> so what would be your favorite dish that you would present? Oh, look, I am very partial to fish. Um, so I would say a whole barramundi wrapped in paper bark with lemon aspen, lemon myrtle, mountain pepper, and salt bush. I mean, I'm going all out here and um, just slow cook on hot coals and just, you know, get the crispiness, get that smoky flavor of the paper bark through that. Um, but then I'd have to say a lemon myrtle chili mud crab is also one of my favorite dishes as well. Oh, and they, these okay. you have dishes, me right? But but I do yeah, like an Aboriginal Singaporean um, mm -hmm. chili mud crab, which is my two cultures. So Aboriginal and Singaporean come together to make Amazing. that lovely Amazing. mud crab. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <Mouth -y>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, <laughs> what time am I coming around for dinner? Yeah, <laughs> you bring the mud crab, I will cook it. Okay, <laughs> yeah, done, better deal. Yeah, uh, you, you <laughs> got, um, all right, day, day, you're invited too. Choice, yeah. <laughs> oh, everybody <laughs> says you're making me hungry. Paul saying the very yeah. this sounds delicious, <laughs> amazing. So, you never know, we might get a cooking uh, online. Recipes. Yeah, pardon. No, no, so those two recipes featured in a um, in a magazine in Sydney, and they um, they were just beautiful. And I had to go down there, and I had to prepare this barramundi, and I took my own paper bark down to Sydney with me, and all my bush tucker, because I was like, oh, I'm not hunting in Sydney for this stuff. <laughs> but they provided the the crab, and they provided the the um, they they went hunting for the crabs and 
and Pe um, Barramundi. And then um, they came in and did a full on photo shoot, Bella. And seriously, wow. these dishes look more famous than me. They were like <laughs> big lights and camera and action. And, you know, let's turn it over here and put the colors there. And it looked gorgeous. And I'm like, okay, and I'm just standing in the background. I am the cook, guys. <laughs> what about camera on me? <laughs> Good ways. <laughs> Oh, Dave, Dave's excited. He says, yes, please. So absolutely. But they, you never know, we might get a, 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 a YouTube cooking show, a uh, little sneak peeks from, from um, the Bush Tucker woman. That could yeah. be something. Maybe some, let Let's us know. We might it. have to collaborate and do something. <laughs> okay, done, done, but, done, done. Amazing, amazing. I still, yo, thank you very much. It's been a very empowering and inspirational uh, conversation. Now, Jans, as I said before, before we uh, went live, every time I have a conversation with you, I always walk away feeling enriched uh, with, with life and just sharing that experience. And I, I, I am um, grateful that you were so open and sharing your story uh, to your all, all, everybody's tuning in right now. And um, yes, uh, it's, it's just been amazing. Before we go, oh look, there's there's a lot of comments coming in. Better, we should we should say hi to a few of them. So, Sister Marie says no Barramundi here. Uh, I will definitely have to buy a book. Uh, your book, Samantha. Yes. Where can people get your book? Is there? Um, oh, uh, okay, yes, so you can go online and look up. Yeah, look up Bush Tucker, and I spell Tucker as in T U double K A. So Bush Tucker Guides by Samantha Martin. You can go online. Um, Hardy Grant is my publisher, so you can order online directly through them or any um, online bookstore, so Amazon or um, I don't know what else is out there really. Um, Explore Australia well, also hosts. In the post of this, I will actually find the link and I will share the link. So everybody, um, you can watch when you go back to rewatch this actual episode on YouTube or Facebook. Yeah. We'll have a, a link to um, the Bush Tucker Guides. Uh, and please to go um, and get that because I'm going to experience it from the cook herself. So I'll tell you guys all about that in a, another live stream. Uh, and <laughs> if, if uh, anybody wants to just um, hit you up uh, and just have a yarn, uh, you know, just to get to know you, uh, could they? Where, where can they meet you on, on social, Facebook, or? Yes, yes, very active on Insta and also Facebook. So they can either get me through my personal pages, which is Samantha Martin or the Bush Tucker Woman. So again, Bush Amazing. Tucker, double K, yay! <laughs> deadly, deadly. My sister, thank you. Before we go, I always ask the guests today, Grace. I see on the show uh, the final question. If you had, and I know we have a lot of values, but if you had one key value that you can impart with you as a gem to the people who are viewing and tuning in now, what would your one be? Wow, oh, that's hard. Okay, I would say um, having compassion. So compassion is so powerful, so powerful. It goes a long way. It allows you to help people and and yeah to feel everything from pain love joy but also if you have compassion you feel other people's um, pain love and joy as well and it allows you to become connected to each other instead of not mm. connected to each other yes <laughs> amazing thank you very much for sharing your knowledge wisdom and jewels thank you um you have a beautiful weekend uh, i let you get back to your roast <laughs> and um <laughs> Uh, Will Yan about us catching up and doing that YouTube uh, cooking show. All so right. So if you wait, I'll have a Yan with you. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Put me in the backstage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, everybody, thank you very much for tuning in here on Powercast. I really appreciate your, your comments. And yes, that was the beautiful sister, Samantha Martin, uh, coming and sharing her journey in life. Uh, I hope you took away some inspirational uh, gems from that. Uh, and look, 
what we would like to do if you could uh, follow us here like this page on, on facebook or go subscribe on youtube uh we have this every friday um you know 7 30 till 8 30 p.m conversations with people who have inspirational stories to share uh when we come on and have a yarn uh it's always amazing and inspirational and it's always um an honor to be here having this conversation with you guys out there joining in on powercast i want to say for my language came may which is big thank you for joining in and tuning in and going on this journey with us. Uh, as we always do and say here, Power Nation, stay inspired, stay empowered, and stay connected. Until next week, everybody be safe and stay blessed. That's all.